Recently, Parliament voted on a Conservative-sponsored motion to declare non-confidence in the government and force an election over the carbon tax. The vote failed, which is very much an expected outcome due to the years-long confidence agreement between the Liberals and the NDP. But you might be asking, what's the deal with the alliance between these two parties anyway? Supposedly, the key part of the deal between the two parties is the NDP wanting a pharmacare program for Canadians, but it took them nearly two years to reach an agreement on that plan, and they still have no timeline for implementation. So today, I want to talk about what I think may be some of the other motivations underlying the agreement between the two parties. That's right folks, it's time for another Friday update with your old pal Millennial Moron. I've only got one story for you this week, and to be honest with you, most of it is just my own personal speculation about the underlying motivations for some of the stuff that's been going on in Parliament over the last couple of years. I did have much larger plans for a much more complicated video this week, but unfortunately I ran out of time. And to be honest with you, this story is enough for its own video, so deal with it. On March 21st, a motion of no confidence failed in the House of Commons. The motion was sponsored by opposition leader Pierre Poiliev and called on the House to declare non-confidence in the government over the carbon tax, which would have dissolved Parliament and triggered an election. Funnily enough, Poiliev didn't consider this important enough to actually be present for the vote and voted electronically while attending a Cash for Access fundraising event in Toronto. If you have a memory longer than a couple of years, you'll understand why this is very funny. Just another reminder that these politicians don't actually believe most of the things they say, and neither should you. In fairness to Poiliev, Justin Trudeau wasn't there either, suggesting that nobody was really taking this vote seriously anyway. However, in the wake of the vote, there's been a lot of talk about the Liberal NDP coalition. I don't think an alliance between parties is anything unusual in itself, but there is actually a very unusual situation underlying this, which I'll get into later. The term Liberal NDP coalition is thrown around by the public and politicians alike these days, and while I see where people are coming from, it's not exactly accurate, so I thought I'd do a quick explanation of some basic civic stuff, then get more into some of the underlying motivations in Canadian politics that you might not be aware of. First of all, calling it a coalition is only accurate in the most general, colloquial sense of the term, as in an alliance between two different groups. However, in parliamentary democracies, a coalition has a more specific definition, which is a formal agreement between two or more parties to form a government together when they collectively hold the majority of seats in Parliament. If this was the case, the NDP would actually be part of the government and would have seats in cabinet, which they don't. In fact, we haven't had a true coalition government at the federal level in over a hundred years. We came pretty close in 2008 when the three opposition parties agreed to form a coalition government after the Conservatives won a minority of seats in the election, but that fell apart after Harper prorogued Parliament and the other parties realized the idea was extremely unpopular. The actual situation is that the Liberals and NDP have entered a supply and confidence agreement, which is much more common in minority governments, but also much less formal of an arrangement, where the larger party will pass the measures demanded by the smaller party, and the smaller party provides the larger party with support for confidence and supply. This means providing enough support to pass votes of confidence, which would otherwise trigger an election, and supply measures, which are basically funding measures for government operations. These are generally considered confidence votes by default, because if you can't get money to do government things, you're not really a government. Whether it's on a formal or informal basis, this happens in basically every minority government because the government still needs majority support to pass confidence votes. The NDP has been supporting the Liberal Party through a supply and confidence agreement for quite some time now. Many people think that this is because both parties are part of the left-wing plot to destroy Canada. But, as I've mentioned in previous videos, I think politics in Canada is not really about principles, it's more about patronage. Which is to say, people aren't trying to get elected to change the way the country is run, they're trying to get elected so they can hand out money and jobs to themselves and their buddies. Why is this minority government in particular so stable? The NDP have threatened several times to withdraw from the deal, but they never seem to come close to actually doing it. In fact, in about three months, this will be the longest standing minority government in modern history, second only to the 1920s government under Mackenzie King. Now, to be clear, this is really just my own speculation on this topic, but I do think there's a possible reason for this level of stability that might not be obvious to the casual observer. Something that's a pretty open secret in Canadian politics, but not that well known among the general population, is that MPs qualify for their pension after six years of service, and this has implications on what goes on in the House of Commons. If they lose their seat before serving for six years, they get a payout of the pension contributions they've already made, plus interest, but if they make it over the six-year line, they qualify for lifetime benefits from the MP pension plan. Obviously, if you continue to serve for more years, the benefits increase over time, but the six-year mark is when you switch from a lump sum payout to a lifetime benefit. So, there's often a strong incentive to hold elections at a time that will help certain MPs get their pension eligibility. However, because of the way election dates are scheduled, we're currently in a situation where MPs who were elected for the first time in 2015 have already qualified for their pension, but MPs who were first elected in the general election on October 21st, 2019 will still need to be re-elected to get their pension, because the next election has to be held on or before October 20th, which is one day before they'll hit the six-year mark. 
For those people, it doesn't really matter when the election is called. They're basically on the hook to get re-elected one more time before they qualify either way, and a minority government has never made it for a full four-year term anyway. So, right now, we're actually in a fairly unusual situation where the exact date of the election call doesn't really determine anyone's pension eligibility. There is, however, one notable exception, Jagmeet Singh. He actually wasn't an MP yet when he was elected as a leader of the NDP, and he was elected to a seat in Parliament in a by-election in February of 2019, after Kennedy Stewart stepped down to run for mayor of Vancouver, opening up an empty seat for Singh. That means that Singh will become eligible for his pension on February 25th, 2025, which makes that a significant date in federal politics, because he has a strong personal incentive to ensure the current government continues until then, but not after. So, at that point, it's possible that we may see that confidence and supply agreement start to break down. It's not unusual to have a by-election winner here and there have their pension hang in the balance based on when the election is called, but it's quite unusual for that person to be the leader of the party providing confidence and supply to a minority government, and have so few other people depending on the result as well. However, just recently, on March 20th, the Liberals introduced Bill C-65 making several changes to the Elections Act, including things like easier access to voting by mail or from a long-term care facility, formalizing the process for voting on campus, and adding two more days of advanced polls. One other thing that was included in the bill was an item about making sure the election date doesn't interfere with a religious or cultural celebration, which just so happens to change the deadline for the next election by one week, from October 20th to October 27th, because October 20th, 2025 would be a conflict with Diwali. In press statements, they also mentioned Alberta's municipal elections falling on the same day. But another implication of this change is that if the government happens to last all the way to the election deadline, 80 more MPs will become eligible for their pensions. The main beneficiaries would be Conservative MPs, with 32 people becoming eligible, then the Liberals with 22, the Bloc Québécois with 20, and the NDP with 6. This means that in addition to potentially granting pension eligibility to 22 of their own members, the Liberals would be creating 58 people in opposition parties with a strong financial incentive to make sure the government lasts for the full term. And because the Liberals currently hold 156 out of 336 seats, they only need 13 extra votes to maintain confidence. Furthermore, the Bloc Québécois only has 32 seats in Parliament, which means that the 20 members whose pension eligibility hangs in the balance form a strong majority of the current sitting members of the party. This includes party leader Yves-François Blanchet. So, it wouldn't surprise me if we see the Bloc stepping up to support this Elections Act bill, or if they step in next year to provide support on confidence motions, which could make this the first minority government ever to last a full four years. Also worth noting, Bill C-65 was introduced on March 20th, one day before the non-confidence motion vote, and the entire Bloc Québécois voted against the motion. For their part, the Liberals have said that this change has nothing to do with pensions and is really just about the holiday and municipal elections, and that all of these things happening all at the same time is just a big coincidence. Well, I'd like to quote the late great Ron Burgundy by saying, I don't believe you. That's all for this week, so as always, thanks for watching and enjoy your weekend. Also, just a side note, in an effort to improve the reach and appeal of this channel, I've decided to branch out into the ASMR space.